Greetings, everybody. This is going to be Judah, part 25. Wow, we're getting up there, huh? This is Chaplain Bob, and uh, yeah, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be... Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. This is page 300. This is in part three of the book, chapter seven. The title of this chapter is A Study in Scarlet. Uh, let's see. Before we read this i'm going to read the scarlet thread from the book of genesis so let me take a look now i have read this in a previous study i don't remember which one you know there's over 20 of them but uh, in genesis 38 is the story of judah Judah married uh, a satanic Canaanite woman. The polluted sea line. You know, people don't believe that stuff anymore, but uh, it used to be a very common doctrine. And um, he had a child by this Canaanite woman. When you go to Genesis 6, uh, you know, they want you to believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were godly men, and then the daughters of men were ungodly women. And then they want you to think these godly men married these ungodly women, and they had giants for children. Um, do believers marrying unbelievers have giants for children? Uh, no. And then in King David's time, um, these giants had six fingers and six toes. There's a lot of that in um, Hollywood. From what I understand, Marilyn Monroe, Halle Berry, uh, Oprah Winfrey all have six toes, or had six toes, I should say. Have or had. Maryland's no longer with us. And uh, there are some groups of Indians out west that have six toes. And there are families in India that have six fingers. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, believing men marry unbelieving women and they have giants with uh, six fingers and six toes for children. Right. And then they'll say, well, angels can't have sex. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. It says that in the resurrection, we will be like the angels in heaven that neither marry nor given in marriage that are in heaven. Well, guess what? Not all the angels are in heaven. They were cast out into the earth. And um, I think it happened long ago, prior to the, somewhere between the time of Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, somewhere among that time. All right, so Judah marries a Canaanite woman, has three sons, the Lord kills two of them because they're wicked. And then um, this pure-blooded Judah woman uh, was to be the wife. And she uh, dresses up like a, a whore, covers her face, so Judah doesn't know who she is. And he's traveling along the road and she um, offers him her services. 
So, so uh, she takes a pledge from him, his ring and uh, bracelets and his staff. And as a pledge to, until he can give her a, uh, a kid, a flock, you know, I guess it's a goat. And uh, so, so what happens? So Judah does the dirty deed with his daughter-in-law. So let's read chapter 38 of Genesis and verse 24. And it came to pass after about three, uh, three months, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot, and also behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. And Judah acknowledged them. Judah said, uh, yeah, those are mine. Okay, so you were the harlot, by the way. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's the Bob commentary. And she's and he and uh, and Judah acknowledged them and said, "She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son." And he knew her again no more. Boy, Judah got her pregnant. One time he did her and, and she got pregnant. Boy, the, yeah. So, Judah's pure-blooded Israelite and Tamar, his daughter-in-law, who he impregnated, is also pure-blooded Israelite. They are not Canaanites. You know, there's a reason why God said to go into the land and kill everything that breatheth. Kill them all. Exterminate them. Get rid of them. You know, that's why the churches discourage, actively discourage their members from reading the Old Testament. Because when you read this kind of stuff and you start asking questions, the pastors... They can't answer it with their doctrinal theology. They, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, those people, the Canaanites, they were they were evil. Well, then why didn't God tell Israel to send evangelists to tell them about the love of, love of God? Tell them about the love of Jesus. Tell them about the Ten Commandments. Why didn't they do that, Pastor? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, well, you, you know, they, they were evil. Yeah. No, kill them all. Go into the land and exterminate them. Don't marry them. Don't take their sons for your daughters. Don't take their daughters for your sons. Don't take them for your wives or husbands. Don't do it. When God says to do something or not to do something, you should pay attention. So, here it is. She's pregnant. Verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail. All right. It's time for the delivery, for the birth. That behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zerah. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to explain it, but I'm just going to throw this out there so you can think about it. Ever since Cain 
and Esau and what have you, um, there seems to have been a curse upon the firstborn until Christ anyways. And the firstborn was to receive a double portion that's in the, the law, the law of Moses. So uh, there, the firstborn's job was to look after his parents in their old age. So he wouldn't be able to do much of a career. You know, if you're taking care of your family, your parents, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to go to law school, right? Or medical school. Well, yeah, farming, whatever. So he was to inherit a double portion of the family's property. So if you had two kids, he would, he would inherit two thirds. That was the way it worked. But the firstborn was to, you know, receive a, a double blessing. But who was the firstborn? Cain, Esau, and others, you know, so how does this fit into with this? I'm not sure. I've read I've read up on it before from other people's opinions and I don't know. Nothing to me makes total sense. So all right, well let's we've covered this. So now let's read about the scarlet thread in uh, chapter 7, a study in scarlet in giving further proof concerning the Prince of the Scarlet Thread, whose, uh, whom historians tell us was married to Tia Tifai, the Eastern Princess, we know of nothing that will be so helpful, satisfactory and convincing as to give his genealogy, beginning with his fathers, Judah and Zerah, and come down from father to son until we reach him. We are able to do this, but only because Professor Totten has faithfully scanned the pages of ancient and modern history, and as a result have compiled and given to the world the genealogy of the Zara branch of the royal family, which was exalted to the throne when the breach was made in the line of Pharaohs in the days of Zedekiah. Now remember, Levi, one of the 12 tribes, was to be the tribe of the priests. They were to serve the Lord in the tabernacle, later the temple. Judah was to be the tribe of the kings. David, King David, you know, Goliath David, yeah, he was of Judah. Christ is of Judah. Joseph, who is reckoned as the father of Christ, which he wasn't, but he was of Judah. Mary was a Levite. She was of the priest tribe. So, and Mary was not technically Jesus's mother either. She carried him in her womb. That is true but her DNA was not used because of the sin nature of human flesh. He is called the last Adam. Jesus had the same mother and father as Adam. And if you want to say Mother Earth was Adam's mother, well, you can, I guess, because he was created from the dust of the earth and God the Father was his father. Adam is actually called a son of God. In Genesis or Luke chapter 3, if memory serves me correctly, angels are called sons of God. Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. And I did a study along the on all these topics that I'm just mentioning here. So Mary was 
technically the mother because she gave birth to Christ, but her DNA was not used. It was Her DNA was corrupted the same as all of us. I know the Catholics love to say, oh, Mary was the mother of God. No, not really. So. All right. Well, they, uh, let's see. Now they, uh, this Professor Totten, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Judah and Zerah and come down from father to son until we reach him. We are able to do this not only because Professor Totten has faithfully scanned the pages of ancient modern history and as a result of, has compiled and given to the world the genealogy of the Zerah branch of the royal family. Okay, um, and he lists a whole bunch of names which I probably couldn't pronounce. Um, so let's just leave it at that and move on. Of course, it is impossible to give Professor Totten's argument by which this genealogy can be verified, but we can still call attention to a few straws which you know show which way the wind blows. First, you will notice that we have italicized some of these names, two of which are Eber and one T-A-I-T, Tayit, Tayit, I don't know. And given this genealogy, we have given the direct line from father through only one son, but some of these men were the fathers of more than one son. Uh, SRU, for instance, the father of Eber, Scott, had two other sons, T-A-I-T, who begot A-G-H-E-N-O-I-N, had a son by the name of Heber. The fact that there are three Hebers in this branch of the royal family is most significant, for that is the name from which comes one of the national names of their races, the Hebrews. And by the way, there is a guy named Eber. Um, let's see, let me find it. It was around the time uh, of the flood or before. You can read about Eber in... Uh, E-B-E-R, Genesis 11, and uh, let's see, they were from the line of Shem, and uh, you can read about him in Genesis 11, and verse 16 and 17. He was the, Eber is considered by scholars the originator of the Hebrews. So, uh, let's see. So, yeah, it says the fact that there are three Eber Hebers in this branch of the royal family is most significant, for that is the name from which comes one of the national names of their races, i.e., the Hebrews. Also, we have told our readers of the confusion which most students of history find in trying to straighten out the history of Ireland but it is generally conceded that there are two distinct phases to the Hebrew story of Ireland. The one is that concerning Jeremiah and the king's daughters, and the other is that which is told in the Milesian records, in which we have the story of the prince who married one of Jeremiah's wards. The Milesian story takes its rise in Egypt and Palestine amid the scenes of Israel's infamy, Infancy, I'm sorry, infancy. Now we are ready to call your attention to two other names in the genealogy of Zerah's royal house, which we have italicized, i.e. E-A-S-R-U and S-R-U. For in the Milesian records, the descendants of these men and some of their predecessors are, were called by a name, which to this name means the children of the red or scarlet branch. Hmm, isn't that interesting? The scarlet branch. The prince in the Bible story as given in Ezekiel's riddle is called a young twig and the highest branch of the highest cedar. And after Zedekiah's sons were slain, 
it was not possible to find a prince who was eligible to sit on the throne unless he belonged to the line of the scarlet thread. For the other line from which Christ came was with the Judeans in Babylon. Hence these children of the red branch must have belonged to the scarlet thread branch of the royal family. The Milesian records also call them C-U-R-A-I-T-H-E-N-A-C-R-U-A-B-H-R-U-A-D-H. That's four words. Or commonly tra well, translated as Knights of the Red Branch. The term Milesium is derived from the medieval title of Gallum, the conqueror of Ireland, who was called Milesius or the Milesian, i.e. the soldier, a term derived from the Latin miles. Hence we derive our word militia or military, and that's from Professor Totten. Furthermore, these knights of the Red Branch, of whom Gallium, the conquering Milesium, was one called themselves C-R-A-U-N-N-O-G-S, or the crowned. The true meaning of their name is treetops, for it comes from words common to all dialects, C-R-A-U-N, a tree, and Og, a tuft or termination. We use the same word for a crown as they did, and the very use of it in common language would be enough to verify this history of race were there not other reasons in their history and legends to establish it conclusively. And that is from Professor Totten. 100 years ago, Joseph Ben Jacob, a Celt and a Catholic in a work called Precursory Proof said, among the five equestrian orders of ancient Ireland, was one called C-R-A-O-B-H-R-U-A-D-H, the Red Branch. Uh, equestrian has to do with horses and riding of horses, I guess. So, The origin of this order was so very ancient that all attempts at explanation have hitherto failed some supposed that it originated from the Ulster arms, which are Luna, a hand sinister coupled at the wrist, Mars, but these admit it should in such case be called C-R-O-B-H-R-U-A-D-H, or of the bloody hand. This man was really proving the Hebrew and Egyptian origin of the Irish Celts. He was applying all the evidence that he found to Joseph, knowing nothing of the story of the breach in the royal family of Judah and the exaltation of the Scarlet Branch who landed in the plantation of Ulster. Ulster is a place in Ireland, by the way. Else he would have known where the place where to place the meaning of that insignum, E-N-S-I-G-N-U-M, of the red or bloody hand coupled at the wrist with a scarlet thread, which found its way into the royal arms of Ulster. The prophet Nahum, Nahum was a minor prophet um, because of the size of his book, his prophecy, not because of the minor importance of the message. Um, a lot of the minor prophets were only, uh, the books were only one page. So that's why they called them minor prophets, as opposed to Isaiah, which is a large 66 chapter book in and of itself. The prophet Nahum, while speaking of the excellency of Israel, says, the shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in 
Scarlet. Wow. I gotta look that up. All right, uh, that's in Nahum chapter two, verse one. He that dasheth in pieces is come before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. So there you go. All right, let's get reading back. Scarlet is the characteristic color of the English army. And they certainly wore red coats during the Revolutionary War. We were recently in an English city and we took particular note of the scarlet thread or stripe which ran up the front, around the neck, down the arms, and up the pantaloon legs of the uniform of the postmen of the province. A British consul once told us that every official order he received was tied with a scarlet thread and showed us one which he had just received. This thing, same thing is true with all English officials to whom written orders are sent and from this custom comes the well-known political and diplomatical metaphor, red tape. Wow, red tape. You ever heard that expression? You know, in government, they are always saying, oh, we can't get anything done because of the red tape. Interesting. I don't even remember this. I, it's been, you know, 30 some odd years since I've read this book. So, all right, let's keep reading. We have also learned from sources which we deem authentic that a scarlet thread is woven into the material from which all ropes are manufactured, which are to be used in the construction of vessels for the British government or Navy. This is done so that under and all circumstances that vessels may be identified as the property of Great Britain, even though they be sunk in many fathoms of water at the bottom of the sea. Hmm. When Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph, he was under the necessity of crossing his hands in order that he might get his right hand on the boy that the Holy Spirit was desi designating as the one whom God hath chosen as the birthright inheritor. And thus crossing his hands, Jacob necessarily made this sign, an X or the sign of the cross. This is the pre-Christian cross of which Relics are found along the trail of Israel as they were being sifted through the nations to the isles of the Northwest and which Ignatius, Ignatius Donnelly finds not only in Egypt and Ireland, but almost everywhere else. Donnelly's object in discussing the pre-Christian cross is to prove that the cross has been a sacred emblem ever since the creation of man and that it originated in the Garden of Eden because of the four rivers which parted in Eden and became four heads. Donnelly finds that in Egypt, Assyria, and the British Isles, the pre-Christian cross was emblematic of creative power and eternity. He also finds carved on Egyptian monuments, uh, he has an image here, it's a, a cross with a circle around it, a very ancient sacred emblem which he says Sir Gardner Wilkinson says was called the cross cake which is as you see a cake with a cross on it 
And as soon as we read this in Donnelly's Atlantis, instantly we associated the Egyptian cross cake with the following. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Uh, I forget what book that's in, but that's a quote from the Bible. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Uh, Bob's note here. Have you ever heard the expression, uh, he's half baked? Yeah. You know, if, if you were baking something and you didn't turn it, it's only half baked, right? So, let's continue. We know that Ephraim was associated with the cross that Jacob made, that he came from Egypt, and if he was not in some way associated with that cake with which we are associated, both Egypt and a cross, why should God use the metaphor cake in a prophecy concerning Ephraim's people? Here is a question for all grades of skeptics from the so-called higher critics. Uh, Bob's note here. You have what's called the higher criticism of the Bible. These are pseudo, pseudo means fake. These are pseudo scholars of the Bible. They were very prevalent in Germany about 200 years ago. And they used what they thought was sophisticated language to try to discredit the Bible. You see, they uh, try to pretend that they're scholars and they call it higher criticism. I call it lower criticism because it comes from the pits of hell. But when um, Joseph was going to bless, I'm sorry, Jacob Israel was going to bless Joseph's sons, you know, Joseph in Egypt, he crossed his hands with the sons. Because Joseph put his, or Jacob put his right hand on the younger and his left hand on the older. And uh, maybe we should read that. All right, let's go to Genesis 48. You know, uh, these so called pastors that discourage people from, you know, they're those under them from reading the Old Testament, well, may the Lord give them their reward swiftly. So, turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 48. Now remember, uh, Joseph went to Egypt where he became, you know, one of the top people. I think he was second or third in command of Egypt. Yeah. And Israel, uh, chapter, I mean, verse 8. Um, so, yeah, Genesis 48, verse 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Whose are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. Now if you don't know the story, um, the other sons of Jacob, Israel, sold Joseph into slavery. Yeah. Yeah. And Israel thought they were, he was dead. So, and Joseph brought them out from between his knees and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, the right hand on the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. 
the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them. Israel, let my name be named on them. Remember, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Rules with God, Prince of God. That's what it, Israel means. Israel, E-L, means is a contraction with reference to God. Israel, let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude, a multitude in the midst of the earth. Does a few million you-know-whos over in the Middle East mean a multitude? No, absolutely not. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove her from Ephraim's hand, uh, from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. So here it is. He's got his hands crossed, his arms crossed with his, you know, hand, his right hand on the younger and the left hand on the old, young uh, oldest. And Joseph's like, no, no, dad, you got it mixed up, you know, and he's trying to pick his hands up and put them on, you know, put your right hand on the, the, uh, the oldest. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He knew what he was doing. He also shall become a people, and he sh also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. See, when you ask uh, your demon nominational preachers about all this stuff, they can't, they can't give you an answer because their theology won't allow it because they're liars and deceivers and they work for the devil's children. And I am absolutely convinced that 90 something percent of them work for the devil's children. There are so many few true pastors out there. Very, very few. So, and he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Behold, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. See, Israel gave Joseph a double, double blessing in the two sons. Uh, moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the land of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. The Amorites were evidently involved with uh, the Canaanites. Now, if Joseph married an Egyptian woman, why would... Jacob Israel bless them. The Bible doesn't say anything good about Ephraim or Egypt. E not Ephraim. E Ephraim's great. Egypt. The Bible doesn't say anything good about Egypt. Nothing. That's why God took them out of Egypt. So just because I move, if I move to Texas. Well, okay, I moved to Tennessee for a couple years. Um, that doesn't make me a Tennessean. No. I lived in Colorado for four years or so. That doesn't make me a Coloradoan or whatever you call it. If I moved to Texas, does that make me a Texan? No. So just because Joseph went to Egypt doesn't make him an Egyptian. 
So, you know. So, the cross, the X. This sign, the cross, has floated in what is known as the Union Jack. Look at the British flag, the Union Jack. It's a cross. From the flagstaffs of the United Kingdom or from the mastheads of English vessels for as many centuries as the kingdom has any history. It is also in that which is now accepted the world over as the national flag of the British people, which is described as a scarlet field with the Union on a field of blue, to which are now added certain Christian crosses, one of which is scarlet and others and across the others there is a narrow strip or thread of scarlet. I'm going to have to remember to put that into the um, this video. There's a lot of crosses on Western nations flags. I think Denmark has one too. I mean, there's a lot of crosses. A lot of them. And oh, by the way, I did a Bible study. Um, actually, somebody wrote a book on it that I'd read. But I did a Bible study on it. Did you know that the furniture in the tabernacle in the wilderness with Moses, that Aaron and um, had was in charge of? The furniture was in a shape of a cross. Did you know that? The furniture inside the tabernacle was in the shape of a cross. Boy, the you-know-whos hate that. And when you get people that say they hate the cross, uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, well, consider the source. So, Ephraim as a cake unturned must mean whatever else it may mean that he has a hidden or unseen side and that he is not altogether the fresh young nation that he seems to be. This new side is the Saxon side with the sign Saxon. How do you spell Saxon? S-A-X, the sign of a cross. S-A-X-O-N. Buried in the very heart of his name and the other side of the Ephraim Israel side, but it is the same old cake with its name of Sax sons, the sons of Isaac, burnt through until it shows on this side. You want to know why the media, the modern day media hates white people? They know who we are. They know who we are and they hate us and they hate Jesus and they hate God the Father. Yes, indeed, people. And when the time of Jacob's trouble comes and they see who's being exterminated and persecuted, the remnant church, persecution will light a fire on the remnant church. The remnant, not the demon nominational garbage passing itself off as the people of God. God on TBN and 700 Prophets of Baal Club. No, God's remnant is small, but they will be on fire for the Lord. And it'll become very apparent who God's chief people are in the time of Jacob's trouble when you look at who is being persecuted and exterminated. Yeah, it's going to become very, very apparent. But until that time, eh, why listen to Bob? What does Bob know, you know? <sighs> if it is true that the sign of the cross became sacred in the Garden of Eden, then surely after the giving of the birthright, it became doubly so to the house of Joseph. But now it is thrice sacred to them, for on the cross their Savior made full atonement for sin. We believe that when Jacob said to Joseph, 
I know it, my son. I know it. He not only knew he had his right hand on Ephraim's head, which Joseph thought should have been on Manasseh's, but that he also knew why he blessed the sons of Joseph with the sign of the cross above their heads. For while he prayed with his hands, thus crossed, he said, God, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And we know there is no one, no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of him who shed his blood upon the cross to redeem men. And I say amen to that, people. To us, it is indeed significant that the birthright blessing was given with the sign of the cross. That the cross was sacred, Jacob certainly knew that God sent his divine word unto Jacob, we Christian Saxons, son of I, Sac, certainly know, and that Judah rejected and that Judah rejected that word made flesh, we also know. Bob's note here. Uh, just remember, Judah married into the Canaanite, satanic, fallen angel tribe via Sheila and what have you. So, what do you think they're going to call themselves? Canaanites or of the tribe of Judah. What do you think they're going to call themselves? Yeah. That Ephraim Israel would receive that word, divine prophecy declared. I'm sorry, we should go back. Certainly know in that Judah rejected that word made flesh, we also know that Ephraim Israel would receive the word divine prophecy declare and that the Saxons did receive that rejected. So what part of Judah rejected, divorced Israel, the Saxons did receive. One in the word of his grace is simply undeniable. Then surely that triple cross together with one which has a thread of scarlet blood streaming down its rugged side must mean more, yea, much more to the people of one certain race than it ever can to some other races. For he who shed that blood said, I am not sent. Now this is Jesus speaking here. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Israel was 12 tribes, people. Jesus said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Our readers now know that the name house of Israel. Uh, hold on a second here. Boy, every time I turn around, they're scanning my computer. Um, uh, well, let's see. Where was I? All right, I found my place. Our readers now know that the name House of Israel was the biblical, historic, and the prophetic name of the birthright people over and again, the name House of Judah for the people of the Judeans people. So if the people known as the Judeans, and they only be national Israel, i.e. all of it, as has been taught by Christendom for lo, these many centuries, then the coming of Christ to the seed of Abraham was a failure in every sense. He's talking about the, uh, the J word that I can't really say on certain channels, you know those that claim to be Jews. Uh, look at the second chapter of the book of Revelation and then look at verse number nine. Yeah. Yeah. You'll get the idea. 
Um, and if this be so, why should the angel Gabriel Gabriel tell Mary, the daughter of Joseph, um, Mary's father's name was Joseph, as well as her husband's? I didn't remember that. That her divine child should reign over the house of Jacob forever. Or why should Mary, after receiving the salutation of Elizabeth, say, He, the Lord, He hath hope in His servant Israel in remembering His mercy, as He spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to His seed forever? Or why should Zacharias, being filled with the Holy Ghost, say, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and have raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. That we should be saved from our enemies. Israel has enemies. God has enemies. What do you think Satan is? He was God's enemy. He became God's enemy. He went from a servant to an enemy. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Huh. Wow. What about my white privilege? Oh, okay, yeah. And from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And that is Luke chapter 1, verses 6, 9 through 7, 5, 69 through 75. We may also further ask, why should Isaiah say, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob and if it hath lightened upon Israel, and all the people shall know, even Ephraim. And that is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. Mark that. All the people of Israel, Ephraim Israel shall know. Yea, they do know, now know, whether they be in the high church or in the low, whether they are Catholic or Protestant. And by the way, people, I'm not a Protestant. I'm a Christian. Um, I never came out of the Catholic Church. Uh, I've been inside a Catholic Church twice. Once was for a wedding that somebody had or whatever. Um, no thank you. And the Protestant churches aren't much better. I'm not protesting against the Vatican because I'm not part of the Vatican. So, whether they attend service at a costly cathedral in some great palatial church or in the little church around the corner, whether they pray in the uptown or in the downtown church, whether they listen to the preached word in the independent mission or in that little mission, the child of some uptown church, which they are holding off at arm's length, whether they attend the revival services of the popular evangelist or whether they stand on the streets of our Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo Israel cities and hear all sorts of evangelists from very good 
to very inferior, yes, surely, whether they listen to any, all, or none, for they hear it as they go. All the people of Ephraim, all the people of Ephraim do know this one thing, namely, unto us a child is born. It is conceded by all Christendom that those who accept the benefits of the new testament, of the new covenant, of which the testator must die before the testament could be in force. Bob's note here. I actually did a um, Bible study on this very, very issue. Um, you know, you ever heard of a last will and testament? Um, a testament doesn't happen. You know, a will's not in force. A will and testament are not in force until the person that wrote it dies. Yeah. So, yeah. It is conceded by all Christendom that those who accept the benefits of the new covenant of which the testator must die before the testament could be in force have the law of that covenant have the law of that covenant covenant have the law of that covenant written in their hearts indeed Paul when speaking of the new testament covenant when he says was established upon better promises than the Mosaic covenant, the failure of which necessita necessitated the making of the new says, behold, they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I made with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be unto them a God and they shall be unto me a people. That's in Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Thus we see the journey of Israel from lo am I, not my people, and am I my people, which is by the way of the blood stained cross. But it is literal fleshly Israel that must make this journey. And by the way, that uh, low am I and am I, not my people to my people, is in the book of Hosea. I did a study on that. I did an entire playlist on you only have I known. Israel, you only have I known. Where I go into this into detail. I mean, when you get done with this, that series, it's, you know, I think it's three videos. Uh, I mean, there's just no other way around it. You know, Paul didn't go to Japan. Paul didn't go to China. Paul didn't go to Mongolia. Paul didn't go to India. Paul didn't go to the Congo or Ethiopia. No. No. He didn't go to Zimbabwe. No. Paul went to Greece and Italy, Rome. Yeah. But it is literal fleshly Israel that must make this journey. This is why God, by the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, says, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. Isaiah 51 and 7, and Isaiah 1 and 2. When the house of Judah rejected Jesus, he asked them if they had read in the scriptures concerning a stone which was rejected and which became the head of the corner. And then he told them that the kingdom of God should be taken from them and given to another nation. Boy, I've preached on that a lot. 
Oof. Uh, and guess what language the New Testament was written in? Not Hebrew. No, uh-uh. It was written in Greek. There are 5,000 partial manuscripts of the New Testament written in Greek. There are zero written in Hebrew. Zero. Let's keep reading. Israel had been rejected, cast out, forsaken, divorced. Jeremiah 3, 8. But in order to be consistent with the prophecies of the Old Testament and many passages in the New Testament, we contend that the other nation to which Jesus referred to could have been none other than the house of Israel, that other nation of the two nations in which the seed of Abraham were divided. Jeremiah 31, 31. Where God, Jeremiah 3, God said he would divorce Israel, but not Judah. Jeremiah 31, 31, God says he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Israel and Judah, not the same. All right. Uh, but, says one Paul, he said, I turn to the Gentiles. I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. And if you look at the word Gentile, it is the word nations. That's what it means, nations. And remember, there was a division between Israel and Judah. So we're talking about the nations of Israel. But the modern church world will say, oh, Gentile means you're a non-Israelite, you're a non-Jew. Uh, yeah, right. True, and in this he was obeying the order to the Jew first, but the Lord certainly sent him also to the Gentiles. The trouble with this word Gentiles to the ordinary English reader is that to his mind, it is always excludes God's chosen people, whereas it only excludes the uh, portion of Judah of the 12 tribes. There are three Greek words in the New Testament which are translated Gentile and Gentiles. One of them is Helen and its various forms, which means Greek, Greece, or Grecian, but is sometimes used in the sense of uh, non-Judah. The other two words are E-T-H-N-E-E -E and ethnos, from which comes our word ethnology or ethnic group. You ever heard of an ethnic group like whites are considered Caucasian, the Caucasian ethnic group? Yeah, ethnos. The science uh, which treats of the different races and families of men. These two words are simply the sing singular and plural forms of the same root word. Liddell and Scott's Greek lexicon defines ethnos, the singular, as a number of people living together, a company, body of men, a host, a tribe, a people. But ethne, the plural, is of course defined by the same authority as the nations, host, tribes, and peoples. Nations, tribes, peoples. God said to Abraham, thou shalt be the father of many nations. The father of a multitude of nations have I made thee. I will make nations of these, and kings shall come out of thee. She, Sarah, shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. God also said to Jacob that thou mayest be a company of peoples and also a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. Jacob, by the command of God, said to Joseph, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people. God in turn said to Joseph through Jacob, He, Manasseh, also shall become a people, and he shall be great, 
Howbeit his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Indeed, we have neither time nor space to tell of all the hosts and hosts, the people and peoples, the nation and nations that are involved in these covenant, covenant, covenant promises, but surely these will suffice to show that those covenant promises are ethical, I'm sorry, ethnical, ethnic, not ethical, ethnical, E-T-H, N-I-C, ethnic, in the fullest and broadest sense. Hence, when Jesus sent Saul of Tarsus to the ethne, i.e. the nations, we dare to say that he included, if he did not wholly mean the nations of the birthright kingdom of Israel, for he said to Ananias in a vision concerning the same circumstance of Paul's call and commission, that he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the ethne or Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Acts 9 and verse 15. It was that Paul might go to the children of Israel that the Holy Ghost hindered him from going into Asia and sent him into Macedonia. Oh boy, I gotta, I gotta, oh, hold on a minute here. I gotta find something for you. Did you know Paul was forbidden to go to Asia? Asia, what they call Asia Minor, uh, Asia Major. And there's Asia, Asia Major and Asia Minor. Asia Minor is considered the Middle East, like around Greece, Turkey. That's considered Asia Minor. Asia Major is Mongolia. China. You get the idea. Now, distinguish between Asia Minor and e Asia Mi Major. In Acts 16, 6, now when they, Paul and his, his companions, and now when they had gone through P-H-R-Y-G-I-A, Phrygia, and the region of Galatia and were forbidden and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Isn't that funny? Paul never went to India. Paul didn't go to Burma. He didn't go to China. He didn't go to Japan. He didn't go to Mongolia. He didn't go there. He went to Rome. He went to Asia Minor. He went to Greece. Yeah. He was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Acts 16, 6. It was that Paul might go to the children of Israel that the Holy Ghost hindered him from going into Asia and sent him into Macedonia. Macedonia is a part of Greece, which included the country once known as Mosai, M-O-S-E-I, and where many of the sacks still linger. Then Paul pushed on into um, I-L-L-Y-R-I-C-U-M, a country which lies still further to the northwest, this is also Paul's reason for wanting to go into Spain, whither he finally went. Irenaeus, I've heard it called Irenaeus and Irenaeus, I-R-E-N-U-S, one of the early church fathers writing concerning the work of Paul says, he established many Christian churches among the Keltoi, K-E-L-T-O-I, the Celts, um, Irenaeus, or Irenaeus, uh, was, I forget if it was him. He was uh, one of those that was, uh, let me look it up. All right, Irenaeus, um, he, he and Polycarp, 
I forget which one is which. One of them was with John. He was his uh, secretary. You know, John, the book of Revelation. I think it was Polycarp. But one of them was with um, John when he wrote the book of Revelation. I think it was Polycarp. And then Irenaeus was the um, disciple of Polycarp, if I remember correctly. So I gotta, I gotta look that. He was born 130 A.D. Okay, Polycarp was from uh, born in 69 A.D. to 155 A.D. Okay, he was with, he was with John, and then Irenaeus was with Polycarp. So you got Saint John, Polycarp, Irenaeus. That's what you call apostolic succession. Some would say. Um, yeah. So John, Saint John, that wrote the book of Revelation, taught Polycarp, and then Polycarp sought sought Irenaeus or Irenaeus, however you pronounce it. I've heard it both ways, but I don't know. So, um, so he said concerning Paul, he established many churches, Christian churches among the Celts. Also, Clement of Rome, of whom Paul speaks as having his names in the book of life, says of Paul that he was the herald of the gospel of Christ in the West and that he had gone to the extremity of the West. Yeah, Paul went all to the West. This could not have been said by a writer at Rome without implying a journey into some countries much further to the West. Chrysostrum, C-R-Y, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M. Another early Christian writer says, Paul preached in Spain. And according to the testimony of several others, Paul also preached the gospel to the Britons. At all events, they received the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of David, became a light to the nations and became the glory of his people Israel, who were ruled over by the descendants of the prince of the scarlet thread and who put a blood-stained cross, the cross of St. George, into the heraldry of their nation. Later, they and their brother nation became the evangel of evangelic, evangelistic. Oh boy, I'm having a hard time today. The UK and the USA became the evangelistic nations of the world. Thus, through the many nations of Abraham's seed, has the one seed, the testator of the new covenant, been a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Well, indeed, may Jesus say, if ye believe not his writings, speaking of Moses, how shall ye believe my words? That is the end of the study of Scarlet, page 313. Boy, this has been a powerful chapter. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this study and all the others. You know, it takes time to do all this stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, one day when persecution comes, uh, I'm sure we're going to be called to um, teach others. You know, some of us are going to be called for um, our our lives to prove our faith to others by probably getting our heads chopped off. Others of us will go into the wilderness, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, to hide from the face of the serpent, the beast, and God has a place prepared for his remnant, his church, in the wilderness, and some of us will be called probably to teach others because they're not going to understand what happened. Oh, uh, but my pastor told me the pre-trib rapture and it, it didn't happen. Uh. Well, yeah, because it was a false doctrine from the beginning to, so that when it fails, 
the uh, rab buys can tell you that Jesus was a false preacher. He was a false prophet. He was a false messiah, they'll tell you. They'll be happy to tell you that. And I'm just wondering how many will fall for that. Well, you know, they didn't bother to read the Bible. If they did, they would know who killed Jesus. They would know who killed the early Christians. They would know who killed the apostles. And it wasn't the Roman Catholic Church. No. No, it wasn't. And it wasn't Pilate either. Pilate tried to release Jesus. Where's that in the Bible, Chaplain Bob? Uh, let's see. That's in the book of John 19 and verse 12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the you know who's cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. For whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Yeah, right. Yeah, people. So, you know, some of you are going to have to uh, teach others. And that's why I do all this stuff, you know. I mean, I don't have a church. I mean, I'm not qualified to be a pastor anyways, or a bishop. I'm not qualified. And, um, you know, I, I, it's my, I consider this like job to uh, teach. And, uh, you know, I don't get paid for this, at least not here on earth. So, which is all right. I'm not complaining. Believe me, I'm not. I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm a volunteer, you know, and you get what you pay for in this life, you know. You know what the difference between a volunteer and a professional is? A professional gets paid. If, if you get paid to drive a bus, you're a professional truck driver or a bus driver. Yeah. You know, if you are paid to play music, you're a professional musician. So... And uh, that's the way it goes. And if you're a pastor in a church and they guarantee you a salary, well, then you're a professional, you're a paid hireling. So, yeah. No, thank you. I'm not a hireling. Uh, I've already been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. So, I'm not for sale. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.